Hi, this is Larry Huppen. I'm a medical consultant at ProLab Orthotics, and today we're going to talk about foot orthotic therapy for posterior tibialis dysfunction, also known as the adult acquired flat foot. So let's look at our focus of intervention. The first thing to keep in mind is that this needs to be addressed with more aggressive biomechanical intervention than you might be used to using. Many orthotics simply fail in that they don't apply adequate forces to take stress off of tissue that is in pain and is causing deformity. In doing so, we have to address the abnormal subtalar joint axis position, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then finally, with that, we have to have a basic understanding of moment arms and how they relate to that axis location. So here's the foot we're dealing with. Uh, this is a, a difficult pathology to deal with in that you have a very flat foot. You have medial subluxation, often a prominent navicular. Uh, here's a skeletal representation uh, with a demonstration of an attenuated posterior tibialis tendon, which allows that foot to flatten, uh, leading to deformity and leading to pain. Often you see, again, that navicular prominent. That's going to come in later when we start looking at writing our, our orthotic prescription. There is a lack of, of great literature on this problem. Uh, there, there's really quite limited amount. Um, this study from Imhauser in 1999 looked at using UCBL orthoses. These are devices with a very deep heel cup and a medial flange. Not exactly the same, but similar to what we're going to be talking about today. And they did provide superior restoration of both arch and hind foot kinematics compared to a standard foot orthosis. So we'll look first at joint physics. We're going to look at the subtalar joint and its axis. And then we're going to look at how do we really control that excessively pronated foot. Uh, we'll look at determining the axis of the subtalar joint. And then finally, we'll end with writing an orthotic prescription based on these principles. So some very basic physics to start with. The first thing to understand is that linear forces need to be converted into rotational forces. For example, when you push on a door linearly, that creates that is it becomes a rotational force around the hinge. With the amount of force around that hinge dependent on the magnitude of force, meaning how hard you push, and then also the lever arm, how far away you are from the hinge. If you increase either one of those, you'll increase the moment arm around that door or increase the moment around the door. So now we're going to look at, look at the lever arm or the moment arm. That is the perpendicular distance from the line of application of force to a joint axis. So we'll just take randomly the ankle joint here, and we'll see that uh, the, the point of application of force is here at the Achilles. And the, the lever arm itself is the distance from the ankle joint over to the Achilles tendon. And if you want to increase that moment around the joint, you have to do one of two things. You either have to increase the magnitude by pulling or pushing harder here, or you have to increase the lever arm. So now, because the, the joint axis we're really concerned about in this situation is the subtalar joint, we're going to look at that here. So most of us have studied the subtalar joint ax axis position. Manter in the 50s and Root in the 60s described it as being 16 degrees from the sagittal plane and 42 degrees from the transverse plane. And by definition, that axis is going to exit through the tailor head and then somewhere around the first and second toes. But keep in mind, those numbers we just discussed, by definition, they are an average. Um, and because they're an average, in most feet, that axis is going to be somewhere else. So th these pictures are courteous. Are uh, courtesy of Dr. Kevin Kirby from his article, Rotational Equ Equilibrium Around the Subtalar Joint Axis, where he discussed subtalar joint axis deviation. And what he noted was that when you compare a foot like this normal foot here to this one here, which is it would be a pes planus foot type, that in this situation, not only is the foot flattened, but the talus and the tibia have internally rotated. And because the axis of the subtalar joint moves with the talus, as that foot flattens and that leg internally rotates, that axis moves medially. And then pushing up from the bottom here, if you look at, so here we're looking at the bottom of the foot, and we have forces that are acting on either side of that axis. So we have ground reactive forces. And if you push up on the medial side of that axis, you're going to apply a supinatory torque. And if you push up on the lateral side of that axis, you're going to 
apply a pronatory torque. So to stop pronation, we need to be pushing up on the medial side of that axis. And what he noted is in that, in that flat foot, that axis deviates, leaving you a much, much smaller area here where you can apply a, a supinatory torque in order to stop excessive pronation. So that'll become very important when we start writing our, our orthotic prescription. So let's look at that one more time. Again, looking at the plantar surface of the foot. Here's a, a neutral foot. And if you can see where in anywhere in the speckled area here is on the medial side of that axis. And when we push up there, that's going to apply a supination moment. And if our orthotic, for example, is pushing up over on this side, it's going to be applying a pronation moment. Now on this, this neutral foot here, there's a lot of surface area where we can apply force to create a supination moment and limit excessive pronation. But now let's look at that pes planus foot type. Again, the foot's flattened, the leg has internally rotated, so the tibia and the talus have internally rotated, and with the talus goes the axis, and now we have a much smaller area here to apply force. So now let's look at this in, in a cross section. This is the Taylor head and the calcaneus here, right? This represents the subtalar joint axis. And underneath here, we have a foot orthosis. And so we're just taking three random points, X, Y, and Z. This on the left is a neutral foot. This on the right is that more pronated foot. And if we just take point X, we can see that it is, it is somewhat, uh, it is actually quite a bit medial to the subtalar joint axis. Y is also medial. And Z is somewhat lateral to the subtalar joint axis. So these two points medial are going to apply a supinatory torque. And this portion of the orthosis is actually applying a pronatory torque. But the resultant force is over here, medial to the axis. And that, that orthosis is acting overall to apply a supinatory torque and helping to stop excessive pronation. But now let's take that same orthosis on this more pronated foot. And we can see that point X is now directly under the axis. If you ever think about an ortho, a patient who comes in who has a flat foot and they have a nice line or callus down the bottom of their foot where they've been standing on the orthosis, that is often what may be happening is that that edge of the orthosis is pushing up directly under the axis. Then point Y is um, medial, or I'm sorry, is lateral to the axis, and Z is quite a bit lateral to the axis. So the resultant force here is actually quite a bit lateral to the subtalar joint axis. That orthosis is actually applying a pronatory torque. Now, it may be less than if they had nothing in their shoe, but it's certainly not doing everything it can to stop that foot from pronating. So by, what we come to here is that to control that pes planus type foot, you must increase the orthotic reactive force, the force the orthotic is applying to the foot on this very limited area that is available medial to the axis of the subtalar joint. All right, so now let's look at our orthotic prescription. We're going to talk about materials. We're going to look at the size of the device. We're going to look at positive cast work. We'll look at posting, top covers, forefoot extensions, and then any special additions. So material is not critical as to exactly a particular material being better than others. It just has to be rigid enough to resist deformation. You can get vacuum form polypropylene or direct milled polypropylene. You could use a graphite or fiberglass device. You could even use an EVA and cork and, or, and cork and leather device as long as they're rigid enough. If they're too soft, the device will compress under the foot and it will no longer it will not be able to apply adequate force to support the foot. So my personal favorite is a vacuum form polypropylene because we're going to be talking about using deeper heel cups and medial flanges and that vacuum form polypropylene conforms to curvature extremely well plus it's very easy to adjust after the fact if adjustments are necessary. We're also going to want to use a deeper than average heel cup and a medial flange which I'll show you in a second. The reason for that, again, and when you go from this more neutral foot to this, this pes planus foot type, is we have a very, very small surface area here, and we want an orthosis that wraps up around the arch to, to put more surface area medial to the subtalar joint axis in order to apply supinatory torque and limit excessive pronation. For the same reason, we want a deeper than average heel cup. And by the way, a deep heel cup by definition is about 18 millimeters. A standard one is 14 millimeters. For this problem, I'll often use a very deep heel cup, 22, 24, even 26 um, millimeters of, of depth. 
Next thing is we're going to talk about what's called the, a varus wedge effect, adding a medial heel sky to the orthosis. So what we're looking at here is a representation of the tibia and the talus here, the calcaneus here, and this little dot is the subtalar joint axis. And then this is the center of force being applied by either the ground or an orthotic. Right? Now, by simply putting a varus wedge under the heel, we shift that center of force farther medial to the axis of the subtalar joint, and once again, it helps to apply a greater supinatory torque around that axis. Now, we can easily add that varus wedge to the interior of the heel cup by using this medial heel skive technique, again, uh, described first by Kevin Kirby in an article in JAPMA in 1991. Uh, this is a modification to the positive cast. It's called a skive because what we end up doing is creating it by filing down the positive cast in this medial plantar region right here. And if you look at this one here and then this cross section, you see how it's flattened here on the positive. That is the skive. You'll see the number four that indicates how deep the skive was. The skive can be two, four, or six millimeters deep. The, far, the deeper we go, the greater the amount of skive there is, and the more we shift that center of force medial to the subtalar joint axis. So when an orthosis is then pressed over this positive cast with a skive, this is what we'll see, right? Here's the wedge within the positive cast, and there's the wedge within the orthotic itself. You'll note that this has no effect on the post. This is not an inverted rear foot post. This is just a flat part a flat portion within the interior of the heel cup so that it shifts the center force farther medial to the subtalar joint axis. So let's look at it here. Here is a standard heel cup. It's rounded on both medial and lateral sides and here is one with that varus wedge or medial skive. And once again that's going to shift the center force farther medial to the subtalar joint axis. Same picture. And you can see it here, again, there's that four indicating a four millimeter heel sky. It's measured in millimeters of depth. So when you're deciding how much to use, that's usually based on the resting calcaneal stance position. Uh, if you have a very mildly everted heel, maybe one, two, three, maybe up to four millimeters or degrees everted, I would use a two millimeter skive and at least a 10 millimeter heel cup. The greater the amount of skive, the greater the heel cup must, uh, depth must be. If you have a moderately everted heel, let's say five, six, seven, eight degrees, you want to use a four millimeter skive and above that a six millimeter skive. With a minimum, these are minimum heel cup depths, I'd actually, in, in that case, Case, I usually go even a little bit deeper than that. Um, now, on another uh, common issue on this foot is a very prominent navicular, as we looked at on that earlier picture. Um, in that case, you probably want to think about putting an accommodation, a pocket within the orthosis itself. This is called a sweet spot. It's often filled with soft materials such as poron. What you can do to determine where to put that is when you're taking a plaster cast to the foot, put a little lipstick on the prominent navicular and that will transfer uh, to show the lab where to put the accommodation. If you're taking a three-dimensional laser scan of the foot, put a small piece of felt on that navicular and that will show up on the image uh, on the laser scan. Um, with this, because we may still need to adjust this area, I would recommend that your top cover be glued heel only. So glue the top cover just in the heel cup, leave it unglued on the anterior portion of the orthosis so you can still get to this area. If the navicular is still irritated, you could add a horseshoe pad or something else, a U-shaped pad around here uh, to take more pressure off of it. The cover can then later be glued down once you're sure that the device is comfortable for the patient. You're certainly going to want a rear foot post to stabilize the device in the shoe. Uh, there's really no evidence in the literature that this is, is corrective. We're not, going to, we're not going to put a varus post on here. We're just taking the round surface of the orthosis and making it flat so it doesn't rock in the shoe. And we'll put a top cover on it, uh, particularly if we have a sweet spot, you're going to want to put a top cover on it so that the poron doesn't wear out. And I would highly recommend, again, that you glue that cover heel only right back here. It would be unglued on the front half. So taking all of that, this might be a prescription for a patient with posterior tibialis uh, tendon dysfunction. You might use a semi-rigid polypropylene, a medial flange, as we see here, wrapping up around the arch, a very deep heel cup, a medial heel sky within the heel cup, a sweet spot for the navicular, 
a flat rear foot post, and the cover glued on the heel only. So thanks for watching that. Uh, if you have other questions on this, please give us a call at this number. You can also find a tremendous amount of uh, information on orthotic therapy at prolaborthotics.com or email us at CS, that's for customer service, CS at prolab-usa.com.